uh, Vincent, which uh, is great <laughs> to give the first uh, workings of the semester. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Vincent joined us in 2016. Before that, he was an uh, assistant professor at the University of Geneva, for uh, then a postdoc at the University of uh, Zurich. Um, and then he had a, a very short time where he was at uh, the University and graduated from here at the University of uh, Adi. And today he's going to tell us about uh, large scale structured probes of cosmological uh, models. Thank you. I, I'm wondering whether you can hear me without the... No. 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 Thank you, Paul. So... So here is the outline of my talk. So I thought that I would do the following, given that most of you are not familiar with cosmology. So I will start with like a review of the standard cosmological model and the questions we, we wish to answer. And then I will basically specialize a bit more on this talk and focus on the topic. So one of the topics I'm working on and which is not really represented here among uh, my students, which is the galaxy clustering as a hope of the large structure of the universe. So I thought the first thing I would do is just to discuss scales, okay? because I will be using a word extensively and this word is megaparsec. First of all, what is a parsec? A parsec is approximately three light years, and that's the basically characteristic separation between stars and galaxies. And so, that, well, basically, my focus today will not be the, the characteristic, characteristic separation between stars, but the characteristic separation between galaxies. And this characteristic scale is approximately one million times larger than, than the characteristic separation between stars, and we call it like one mega parsec. And so, the large structure of the universe, which is basically I mean, how galaxies are distributed, galaxy cluster are distributed in the universe, it's basically about scales from 1 to like 1,000 megaparsec, as far as it goes. And so there is something which is, uh, I mean, really important, which is the fact that if you go to very large scales, like if you go to, I mean, distances of the order of 100 megaparsec and more, our universe looks very much homogeneous and isotopic. And so we assume, actually, that it is homogeneous and isotopic on this very large case. And this is known as the cosmological principle. And what is great with this principle is that basically it's telling us that the universe is fair. So if I do a measurement uh, of the large scale structure in, let's say, from the point of view of Earth, I know that this would be representative of the large scale structure in the whole universe. So if you go to this very, uh, very large case, there is something really which is very uh, peculiar, which is the fact that the, we find that our universe is expanding. So that's, that's a completely different lab than the lab you are used to work with every day. Uh, and so uh, because uh, of the cosmological principle, this expansion occurs everywhere in the universe. It's homogeneous in size of problem. And so what we have to do, basically because, I mean, What's going on is that physical scales, all physical scales are being stretched by the expansion of the universe. We need to use some special coordinate system to describe this effect. And so basically what we do is that we write physical scales R as like a scale factor, which describes the isotopic expansion time, a co-moving position. And so basically the fundamental uh, coordinate in an expanding universe is this co-moving position X. And it's related physical scales by the scale factor, but what is really important here is the following fact, is that physical scales are only defined at a given time, okay? You cannot, like, you cannot define the physical distance between two events in the universe, in, sorry, in the universe if uh, these two events did not occur at the same time. Whenever you want to compute such a distance, you first have to compute the co-moving separation between these two events, and then you have to multiply by the scale factor to translate it into a physical distance at a given time t. Uh, another point which is important is that the co-moving coordinate x is generally a function of time. Uh, only basically if the universe were really homogeneous and isotropic, you could define it's a set of fundamental observers with fixed co-moving position and this observer would see a perfectly homogeneous and isotropic universe. But our universe is not homogeneous and isotropic at small scales. There are inhomogeneities. So basically, objects in the universe will be moving, and so their moving position will change as a function of time. 
So the expansion of the universe is characterized by an expansion rate which we call Hubble rate for the, for the reason that uh, we uh, shortly made very clear. And uh, uh, so this expansion has some uh, important, all kinds of important consequences, and one of them is, uh, is the follow is the cosmic redshift. So because all physical scales are stretched by the expansion, then also physical wavelengths are stretched by the expansion. This implies that physical momenta decay as one over the scale factor. So maybe uh, I should point out that because the universe is expanding, this function m a of t is growing with time. You have some freedom to normalize it to unity. Okay? You can normalize the scale factor to unity, <coughs> then, which implies that at any time in the past, because the universe has been expanding, this factor is less than 1. And so, you basically you can show that in an expanding universe, there will be a cosmological redshift because Basically, the wavelength emitted by an observer as it propagates toward the emitter will be stretched with the expansion of the universe. And when you do the measurement here on Earth, for instance, you will find that, I mean, there is a cosmological redshift that comes out of this expansion. On, tip, on top of this cosmological redshift, you also have, obviously, I mean, a Doppler shift that could come from the fact that there is a relative velocity between the emitter and the observer. But what I want to insist on here, which is really fundamental, is that there is no way you can interpret this whole redshift as a Doppler shift only. I mean, the cosmological redshift has fundamentally nothing to do with the Doppler shift. <coughs> the only way to interpret it is simply the fact that if you want the fundamental frame of the emitter is like different from the, from the frame of uh, the observer. And that's because of the expansion. So what you can do is that, I mean, you can measure, and I will show you how you measure this, this cosmological uh, redshift going to the data, but you can, do, uh, uh, you can do a measurement locally, and if you do a measurement locally, then you can basically express, re-express this term as basically the expansion rate times a physical distance, because now you do, if you want to do the measurement at a fixed uh, cosmic time, so you can use physical coordinate divided by C. And so if you multiply then the redshift the Z by the speed of light C, basically assuming that if you want to interpret it locally as a small Doppler shift, then you get a relation between the observed speed, observed relative speed of the object relative to you, as the basically this so this speed is basically given by the by the expansion rate times the physical distance. So that's actually using basically this simple relation. That's how basically Edwin Hubble uh, discovered that the universe expands. Basically, uh, he measured, uh, he observed that most nearby galaxies are basically moving away from us. And so he inferred actually from this measurement the present day expansion rate, and which is uh, known as uh, now the Hubble constant uh, H naught. So let me explain how he did the measurement. So what, what Hubble actually did measure is this H0 here. So what he did is basically like a, a velocity. Of if you interpret now this cosmological redshift as a Doppler shift. And you also need a physical distance to the object. So first of all, how do you measure redshift? Well, it's very simple. What you do is that you take the spectrum of a, any distant object, and then you look for uh, spectral lines in the spectrum. Non-spectral lines. So here I'm using like a spectrum of a distant, uh, distant galaxy. Uh, and basically, so there are all kinds of uh, emission and absor mostly uh, absorption feature, but there is one emission feature which is very prominent, and this actually is the Lyman alpha emission lines. And basically, we know it also from the context, because we know that these galaxies are surrounded by neutral gas, and so this neutral gas is basically excited, excited by radiation coming from the galaxy, and then basically, uh, the, the neutral hydrogen they excite and emits photons in the Lyman alpha line to us. The bottom line is that in the lab, this Lyman alpha transition is measured to have a wavelength of 12, 16 angstrom. While here you see that the observation, the observed wavelength is actually close to 5,000 angstrom. So from this, you infer that the object is at a redshift approximately of 3. Okay? So, 
uh, basically that's what Abel essentially did in uh, 1928, but uh, of course he was at that time observing objects that are much, much closer than us, basically local galaxies of the local group. So once you have this redshift, you interpret the cosmological redshift again because you do a local measurement as a double shift, and so you simply have to multiply the redshift z by c, and you get, if you want, a relative velocity of expansion. So you have one term of this, of this upper loop. Now you need the second term, which is the proper distance. So how do you measure the distance locally? Well, so Hubble was really, really clever because he basically uh, used, uh, if you want, a method which is known, yes? How do you know that it's Lyman alpha? Sorry? How do you know that it's Lyman alpha? Because basically you have, I mean, you have many other absorption features, right? And, and emission lines, so you can basically, I mean, you know, you, you basically, uh, scan for all these absorption lines and we find also metal absorption fission by cross correlation you figure out that this should be the Lagrange like emission lines that's how it goes and you're just using cross correlation you measure different lines and they should all be redshifted in the same way obviously you should always get the same redshift whatever the line you're using okay there is a unique redshift <coughs> so how do you measure distance so he used basically, uh, if you want, uh, a standard code, a standard candle, which is uh, which are Cepheid stars. So he noticed that Cepheid stars, they are basically pulsating stars, and uh, basically the period of pulsation of these stars is tightly correlated with the absolute luminosity of these stars, so the intrinsic luminosity of these stars. And uh, so this. This is an experimental fact that was basically well uh, confirmed in the early 1920s. And what he, what he found is that he found some of these stars in the nearby galaxies. So what he did was to measure the period of pulsation of the stars, which is basically of the order of 10 days, 20 days or so. And then he used this period luminosity relation calibrated from measurement in our local galaxy to infer what the absolute luminosity of this object <coughs> Okay? And so then you do basically the very simple measurement, right? You're measuring a flux on Earth. You know what's the absolute luminosity of the object, so you infer the distance. Okay? So that's what he did. And then basically for all the nearby galaxies, he plotted, uh, he basically completed the correlation between the distance uh, from us to that galaxy and if you want the, the Doppler shift in this case, but that's really the expansion, the cosmic polar shift. And he found that there is a tight, um, there is a correlation. Basically, the, um, the observed Doppler shift increases with the distance. If there were no expansion, basically, in the universe, I mean, you should have all points lying here just on, the, just on some horizontal lines. Of course, of course, there is some, sc some scatter because, as I told you, on top of the cosmic polar shift, there is also the redshift from peculiar velocity, or the Doppler shift. But he got the trend. Okay? And so what you find is that you find that basically that the current value of the expansion rate, the Hubble, the Hubble constant, is of the order of 70 km per second per, per megaparsec. Which tells you that basically a galaxy like Andromeda M31 is uh, moving away from us at the at 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 speed of 70 km per second. No, so here basically he found each of, he found Cepheids in each of these objects, and each of these objects here is a galaxy in our know, nearby universe. So it's one galaxy. Okay. So now let's try to understand a bit what are the consequences of uh, of this extension. Because I told you, so the universe expands, which means that when I go backwards in time. The universe, if you want, was smaller, and so I expect that the density was higher also, and it was very likely hotter. So what can I say about this? Well, so here is what we think. We think that in the very, very early universe, basically, I mean, of course, there was, I mean, uh, like a plasma of particles, and that uh, because the interaction time uh, between these particles was much, much shorter, typically, than the extension time, you basically quickly achieved, like, uh, a uh, state of thermal equilibrium uh, with maximum entropy. And then, uh, after that, after this uh, 
after you establish this initial thermal state, plasma, basically the, the expansion of the universe essentially occurred adiabatically uh, simply because you were always, always very close to local thermodynamic equilibrium, right? The expansion of the universe is true. I mean, it's not in itself an equilibrium process, but because the interaction time are typically so short relative to the expansion rate, you can always, always, I mean, very quickly uh, uh, relax to uh, local thermodynamic equilibrium. So in a very good approximation, the entropy per moving volume, so what I mean is that the volume that is expanding with the, the universe, the volume that goes like the scale factor to the cube, so the entropy per moving volume is conserved. Okay? So that's what you get. Well, here, S is the entropy per physical volume. So what can you say about this entropy? So there is a very nice uh, observation that you can make, actually, uh, looking at data, and that actually tells you quite a bit about this. So it's, it's basically, you compute the following. You compute the ratio of the baryon density to the photon density. But to, to be a bit more precise, you compute, the first of all, the difference between the observed density of baryons and antibaryons. Do we observe antibaryons? No. So this is, this is zero, but it does not matter. Okay? That's basically what you're observing in the universe today. Okay? You're observing this difference, and you divide it by the number of photons. And so you can do this measurement, okay, essentially, in the universe today, and you find that it's of the order of 10 to the minus 10. The bottom line is that this ratio did not change much, I mean, back to the early universe. So it was also of the order of 10 to the minus 10 during nuclear, nuclear basically from nu big bang nucleosynthesis until now. And then basically what you naively expect is the following, is that basically the entropy in baryons should be proportional to the number density of baryons, the entropy in photons should be, should be proportional to the uh, number density of photons, so you expect that the ratio of uh, the entropy in baryons to the entropy in photons is the order of 10 to the minus 10. So what does this tell us? Basically, all the entropy is in photons or basically relativistic particles which have an energy basically uh, given by simply by their momentum. Yes? The number of photons depends on temperature. No? Yeah, so, so, but what I'm saying is that you always very close, yeah, so you always, I will come back to this, okay? So you're always very close to local thermal equilibrium, so it's just given that this basically step and what's my job. So it goes like T to the cube. It changes, okay? It, it changes like T to the cube, okay? But I will show you that the temperature goes down like the scale factor, the same way as the number density of baryons goes down with the scale factor. So that's what makes this ratio concern, okay? I will come back to this shortly. So, first point to make from this is, I mean, the entropy is mostly in photons or relativistic particle, and then we have this huge number, which is a bit surprising, okay, that's not obvious, where does it come from? Why is the entropy in relativistic particle so large, okay, compared to the entropy of baryons? I won't discuss this, but now we move now to this side, I want to say a bit more about this. Okay, so what this is telling us, this is also telling us something very interesting is that the relative difference between the abundance of baryons and anti-baryons in the universe <coughs> is actually very small, okay, relative to the number of photons. But it's not zero. There is an excess of baryons in the universe relative to anti-baryons, which we don't see. The question is, where does this excess come from? So at this level, basically, uh, you can do, basically, there are two ways, right? Either you say that the excess existed at the beginning, I don't know what created it, but it's there. Or you try to generate it basically from first principle during some, uh, as, as basically out of equilibrium transition as the universe experiment. Why does it have to be out of equilibrium? Because if basically what you need if you want to create an excess of, of, of baryons or anti baryons you need to have a process that violates something that is known as baryon number. Now if you are in thermal and chemical equilibrium, then the chemical potentials of the baryons and the chemical potentials of the antibaryons will be the same. Because baryons and antibaryons have the same mass, this implies that the number density of baryons will be always equal to the number density of antibaryons if you are in thermal and chemical equilibrium. So what does this mean? The fact that we observe this to be non-zero implies that there was a time where all this was out of equilibrium. 
So I want to stress here the following. I want to stress that adiabatic expansion, local thermodynamic equilibrium, it's a very good approximation, but you have to remember that there were some times in the universe where things were out of equilibrium, and they're actually very, very important to understand <coughs> what are the contents of the universe today. So now let me come back to the equation of S. So because all the entropy is in relativistic particle and your interval equilibrium, then you expect it to scale like T cube. Now the volume goes like A cube, okay? So you get that the temperature of the relativistic plasma goes like <coughs> 1 over K. Okay, so basically you have like adiabatic cooling, right? The temperature goes down as the universe extends. And now you see, okay, the following. So here S gamma will go like 1 over A to the cube, or L gamma will go like 1 over A to the cube, okay? Because they are the same. And then the number, the number density of baryons once basically uh, it is concept, so basically once all the baryons and anti baryons are annihilated and you're, you're left with this little leftover of baryons, the number density of baryons is conserved, and so it has to go also like one over eight. And then that's the reason why this ratio is basically constant throughout most of the history of the universe. So, so what do we then? What do we learn from this? Okay. So we learned that the universe cools down as it expands, and so this has important consequences. So I found this, this figure on some website. Okay, and basically this summarizes to some extent like all the important events that occurred during the expansion of the universe. So everything started around that point, which you can think of the Big Bang or whatever, we just don't know what's going on there, okay? Then uh, you see there is, so let me just tell you, uh, sorry, this is time, so this is time zero, and this is today. And here you have the scale factor of the universe, okay? Uh, it's symmetry relative to that point. So there is, here there is, you see, there is a huge step, uh, which is introduced because we believe that in the early universe there was a phase of what we call inflation that occurred. Okay, I won't go into the details here, it's not important, but that's a phase of accelerated expansion where the scale factor increased by order of magnitude. And then here basically you thermalize and you form this, like, uh, uh, thermo, uh, plasma interval equilibrium, and then you expand much more slowly. But as you expand, nevertheless, you cool down. So in the first phase, the temperature is high enough such that the whole plasma is ionized. You have free electrons and free protons, okay, interacting to uh, Coulomb scattering. You have free electrons interacting to uh, Compton scattering with photons. But at some point, basically, the temperature, so here everything is okay, okay, because the interaction time is very short. You cannot see anything from this period. But at some, at some point, the temperature became cool enough such that electrons could recombine with uh, free protons to <coughs> form hydrogen. And that's at this, basically at this, at this period which we call recombination, which happened approximately 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Okay? This corresponds to a scale factor 1,000 times smaller than today. Or if you translate this into a redshift of wavelength, 1,000 times a redshift of 1,000. The temperature of the universe of 3,000 Kelvin. At that time, the, basically, uh, <coughs> electrons and protons recombined to form uh, neutral hydrogen, and that basically uh, allowed the uh, photons to uh, decouple from the rest of the matter. So from that period until now, the photons essentially propagate freely in the universe. And we see them today as like this Riemann heat. But of course, because the universe cools on adiabatically today, I mean, back then we had like a basically black body spectrum of photons at 3000 Kelvin. And today, because the universe has expanded by a factor of 1000 between combination until now, we see them as a black body spectrum of approximately 3 Kelvin. And then, of course, I mean, gravity comes in. And so gravity will amplify basically the fluctuations which turn out to be tiny, okay, at that epoch, into highly nonlinear structure at all scales. And so what we do in cosmology <coughs> is basically we try to combine all the information that we have here from basically recombination until now to understand how this structure evolved. So let me tell you now 
what are the basic ingredients you need in order to uh, build a viable cosmological model according to our present knowledge, okay. which you will see is fairly incomplete. First of all, we need relativistic particles. And so for relativistic particles, basically, uh, so what I mean is that the energy is essentially proportional to the momenta. Uh, we, I mean, we use basically the Stefan Boltzmann law, right? So the density goes like t to the 4 because t goes like 1 over the scale factor. This tells us that the density of relativistic particle decays as 1 over the scale factor to the fourth power. So basically, what this means is that they matter a lot in the early universe, but they matter much less in the late time universe. And then you see this here. Okay, so here what I'm showing is basically the energy content of the universe at recombination. And now, so as the combination, you see you have here relativistic particles, you have photons, basically, and neutrinos, and they matter, they basically make up like nearly one quarter of the total energy content. But because their energy density drops actually faster than that of non-relativistic matter, today they are fairly irrelevant. Now, what about non-relativistic matter? Well, here it's very simple, right? So the energy is basically proportional to the mass. If you have a conserved number of particles, okay, as we expect to have, then basically the energy density is simply given by the dilution of particles in the expansion. It goes like one over the volume, so it goes like one over the scale factor to the cube. Okay, so these particles, non-relativistic particles, they matter not too much at high energy in the early time, but they matter definitely a lot to them. And when you basically uh, look at the data, then you get the first surprise, which is the fact that among this non-relativistic uh, matter, actually only 20% of, of it is given by like atoms and non baryons Most of it is actually uh, uh, in the form of some unknown dark matter, okay, which uh, I will come to uh, soon. <coughs> and, then, actually, and then you need a third ingredient, which is actually a dark energy. So what is this dark energy? It's very mysterious. But it's basically introduced in, in order to explain the observed actual acceleration of the, of the expansion of the universe. And so basically, in this case, the energy density has to be constant. And you have to choose a pressure which, which is basically minus the energy density. To understand this, just think of the following, right? So you take a, you take a, a volume and you expand it. And you want to keep the density in this volume constant, so you need to, to bring in energy, right? Because the volume becomes bigger, where do you take the energy from? To some extent, it's like the PV work, okay? The PDV work done by the expansion, okay? You have minus P dV, but because the pressure in this case is minus rho, it's like you're extracting energy from the expansion. Okay? It's very, very peculiar. But it seems that that's essentially, it's very close to, the, to, you know, to what we need to explain the data. Yeah, the dark matter is non-relativistic. The dark matter is non-relativistic, yeah. It has to be cold. Otherwise, we do not have structure to the essential. So, you will say, well, is there any evidence for these crazy things? Well, there is a lot of evidence. Obviously, we are completely ignorant about the nature of dark matter and dark energy. But there is a lot of evidence. It actually, regarding dark matter, it started actually nearly like uh, 90 years ago like with some Swiss astronomer, Fritz, Fritz, Fritz Wittig, who actually noted, uh, he did like a very simple calculation. He looked at uh, the radial velocity dispersion of galaxies inside cluster. And you, if you expect that the cluster has realized then there is a, basically a relation between the characteristic velocity dispersion and basically the, the gravitational energy. Okay? And so what he did is was to estimate the gravitational energy from the from the light from the galaxies he could see from that cluster, and he measured the radial velocity dispersion. But what he found is that to explain the observed rad radial velocity dispersion, he need he needed basically like approximately ten times more mass <coughs> than he could infer from from the luminous galaxies. So that was the, basically the first mention of dark matter, and then this basically was later. Uh, the problem came back when, when people tried to explain rotation curves of galaxies. Uh, so that's the work of Rubin. Uh, you've probably heard about this because uh, Mordechai Bigrom in Israel has been discussing this a lot. 
and I just try to explain actually this, this result with like modification of gravity. Of gravity. Uh, let me say something uh, about dark energy. I think the first evidence actually you always hear about supernovae, but that's not true. I think the first mention uh, of like the possible existence of dark energy is uh, actually uh, actually the result uh, of a large scale structure survey, which basically measured the position of like uh, approximately uh, a few tens of thousand galaxies, and they found that in order to explain the result, they needed something in addition uh, to dark matter actually. <laughs> But uh, that's really with like uh, uh, supernovae and basically the standard kind of technique that uh, the existence of this dark, dark energy was confirmed. So what I want to do now is basically not to go through all this, but I just wanted to point something regarding dark matter. There is a way, an easy way, you can see that you need you need some extra component of matter if you want to explain the fluctuations that you see today. And so the way to, to see that is to is to uh, is basically first of all to look at the cosmic microwave background. So basically the remnant kit from uh, from the early uh, from the early universe. So that's this black body spectrum that you see here. Okay, frequency, brightness, very close to black body, to that temperature of approximately three Kelvin. So it was predicted actually by by Gamow. So its existence was predicted by Gamow. Alpha in uh, 48, and it was actually discovered by chance in 1965 by Penzias and Penzias and Wilson. The first point that I want to make here is that if you point your antenna in any direction of the sky, you will find three approximately the same temperature everywhere, which is quite remarkable. Right? So it's very very uniform across the sky. But there are some small fluctuations. So. If you basically remove the monopole, so this overall uh, uniform temperature, and remove the dipole, because Earth is moving relative to the rest frame of the cosmic microwave background, then you see small fluctuation in the temperature. They were predicted by Peebles and you, Zunia Selovich, in the early 70s, and they were finally discovered with a satellite experiment in 92. And so here you have a map across the sky of these small temperature fluctuations in the in, in the small fluctuations in the temperature of the black body. And so what is what is important here is that these fluctuations now of the order of 10 to the minus 5. First. Second thing, you expect that until this radiation was formed, basically until the photons decoupled from uh, the rest of the plasma, baryons, electrons and photons were very tightly coupled through Coulomb and Compton scattering. So basically, what does this mean? This means that the baryons, they felt the radiation pressure, the large radiation pressure of the photons. So whenever you would try to compress baryons, because there was some over density, the radiation pressure would resist the compression and basically set up acoustic oscillation, or sound waves. So if you want, what you are seeing here is that you are seeing like a snapshot of these sound waves when the cosmic microwave background where these photons decoupled from, from the plasma. And what is important is that this implies that fluctuations in baryons couldn't grow. They couldn't grow because of the radiation pressure. And the characteristic scale, which is the gene scale, okay, is very large. If you do a calculation, you find that at time of recombination, the gene scale, so the scale below which there is no way you can grow fluctuation, it's of the order of 10 to the 16 solar masses. Okay, so it's bigger than the biggest galaxy clusters we see today. <coughs> so what does this mean? This means that fluctuations in the baryon density at that epoch, they were of the same order, of the same order as that of the temperature, 10 to the minus 5. Now, the bottom line is that we see non-linear structures today on nearly all scales up to scales of cluster of galaxies. So I'm talking about here, I have a nice example. It's known as it's one of the clusters from the Apple, Apple catalog. So basically it's made up of tens of galaxies. It has a mass of the order of 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15, and a radius of from 2 to 10 megaparsecs. The bottom line is that the fact that I see something like that in the in nearby universe, what does this tell me? It tells me that, for sure, I mean, this is highly nonlinear, so for sure, 
I mean, if I had extrapolated linearly the density from the early time until now, this should certainly be of order unity. Okay, which means that when the linearly extrapolated density is of order unity, everything is breaks down. You are actually adding only linear. Okay. So let me summarize these two facts. So the density of fluctuation that recombination invariants ten to the minus five. I see nonlinear structure today on those scales, so I expect a linear, linear, linear extrapolated density of order unity. Now I go to linearized growth equations. So it looks like this. So there is a second derivative, then there is the gravitational force, okay? But because we are in an expanding universe, there is an extra term which is this friction. It's like, like a friction term. Basically, the expansion slows down the growth. And so what is very important, this is very important because basically, if you didn't have this term, you just have delta double dot minus delta is zero, which tells you that delta basically has two modes, one of which is growing exponential. But because you have a friction from the expansion of the universe, you turn this exponential growth into a power of growth only. And you find that Basically, for non-relativistic matter, this growth should be should scale like the scale factor. Okay. So what does it imply? This implies that if today I see non-linear structure, so this is unity, I should have started at the time of recombination with basically a factor of a smaller, but a I remember was 10 to the minus 3. So this linear fluctuation should have been of order 10 to the minus 3. But I observe 10 to the minus 5. If I observe 10 to the minus 5, how can I get to 1 to that? There is no way. There is no way. There is no way to do that. And that's the reason. That's, I think that's a very strong evidence also really in favor of like, like, like unknown component of, of matter. Basically, what dark matter does is that when you plug dark matter in the model, it can start growing before recombination because it does not feel the radiation pressure. Okay? So it has already started growing before recombination, and then when the when the bonds decoupled uh, from the photons, they basically catch up with the fluctuation in the dark matter. So some questions, basically the typical questions we want to answer. So dark energy is it the cosmological constant of Einstein? In which case the energy density of this dark energy or the pressure, so it would be exactly minus the energy density. Is dark matter a weakly interacting massive particle? Or is it actually even a particle or something actually completely different, like some modification of gravity? What is the origin of the fluctuations we observed? Did they, did, uh, were they produced during inflation or like uh, are there some other mechanism? What's the origin also of this baryon anti baryon uh, asymmetry? So I think there are I mean, fairly fundamental questions, I would, I would say, and they pertain to not only cosmology, but various fields of, of, various fields of physics. So how to answer them? Here you have a revolutionary ID, okay, which is great, so please tell me. Or you let's say, take a more pragmatic way and you say the following. We're going to get a lot, lot of data in the next 10, 15 years. So what's the goal? To go into this data and try to look for unexpected signals. Try to look for inconsistencies between these different data sets. And obviously, if we want to, really, to make a case in favor of one or another explanation, we need to use <coughs> techniques that have a very high signal to noise. So that brings me to the second part of the talk. We still have some uh, not too uh, tired. Uh, so one of these techniques is, is galaxy clustering. So let me show first of all what you observe. So you sit here at the center, and you look further away. Okay. Each of these points here is a galaxy. I've drawn here the, what I call the scale. Remember the scale of homogeneity, the scale basically above which the universe should be approximately homogeneous and isotropic. So here you clearly see that ah, but Vincent is lying. It's not on that. It's not homogeneous. <coughs> Don't worry. That's just a selection effect. Okay. When you select galaxies, you select galaxies above a certain flux limit. You want above the sensitivity of your of your apparatus. 
So of course, as you go further away, they become fainter and fainter, and at some point you don't see them. Okay, so that's just the reason why here the number density apparently drops okay, as I go. Now, you see, there is a lot of structure. I mean, I wanted to tell you, look, I mean, there is a huge signal to noise here, right? Because I see that this distribution of points is not random, okay? Actually, galaxies yeah, seem to align along filaments, and there are all kinds of pictures, like also along the line of sight, okay? So, what do we want to do? We want to do the following. We basically want to count, essentially, pairs, triplets of galaxies, and see how the number of pairs and triplets of galaxies deviate from what we would get from the random distribution. So essentially, in terms of like, uh, like more technically, what we'll be measuring, okay, we'll be basically measuring the number density of galaxies as a function of observed redshift and the, uh, position, oh, sorry, position on the sky. And you will be basically, basically you, will be, you, you try to compute statistics, okay? Because just based on one object, you cannot say anything. So there is a first possibility to tackle this problem is that to simulate the universe. Okay, so that's many people do that. They basically run simulation, they simulate the galaxy distribution that we see, then they apply their estimators to the simulation and they say, look, it matches, look, it does not match. Okay. So I just want to stress what, I, what is in this simulation. So this is a typical the typical one. Okay. So you basically you, you need to take a fairly large box because you want to have a fair sample of the universe. And then what you put in this box is, you know, it depends on you know, what you assume as cosmological model. But, but I mean, nearly invariably, you assume that there is dark matter. So you put dark matter particles. But they are not particles, right? Really, like, genuine particles from the high energy physics world, because there would be so many that, that mean. They are uh, effective particles. And why? Basically, they have, they have the mass of a typical galaxy. And why can I do that? That's because it's called dark matter. It's called dark matter, so it has very small random motions. So I can basically only look at bulk motions, and in this case, I can use like some big effective particle in order to understand how these bulk motions shape basically the large structure. And then, of course, all this is is done using co-moving coordinates. So you should imagine that actually the physical volume when you start the simulation is extremely small, and then it grows up gradually. And then what we will find is that if you run this simulation, we will find that basically matter will aggregate like in a network of filaments. And uh, along these filaments and at the nodes of these filaments, you find like highly variable structures which we call dark matter reals. Okay, basically where the overall density was large, I mean dark matter formed virulent structures. And what we expect is that the baryons once they basically uh, decouple from the, from the photons, they basically fall onto the potential wells of this dark matter and they form galaxies. So the galaxies will basically sit in this dark matter here. So I, I will not have the time to say much more about that, but okay, let me just say something. There was a movie, but we'll just keep this. So this is very nice, I think. I mean, you can learn, obviously, you can learn a lot from this type of approaches, but I mean, to some extent, it's not very satisfactory. Right? I mean, you would like to understand a bit better what you are actually measuring, what you are doing, and what you will compute. And so that brings me to basically the last, uh, the last part of my talk, which is basically describing some of the work I'm doing right now okay, on this topic. So I'm trying basically to, I'm taking a more theoretical perspective, and I want to describe like a bit more rigorously uh, what we do when we do galaxy cluster. So I want to understand basically how this number of density of galaxies at a certain coordinate time and cosmic position, I mean, on which fundamental like physics of, of the level this quantity depends on. Okay, so what I'm sketching here is basically I'm sketching the following. I'm taking two galaxies because I assume that I will, I will be measuring pairs, okay, separation of pairs of galaxies. They basically started somewhere, okay, in the initial condition. They were not reformed, but I mean, at that time, I mean, the gas uh, had not cooled down to form galaxies, but you know, they followed some trajectory in the universe, and then the gas cooled down on the top of the dark matter halo from that galaxy, and same for it here. Okay, now I'm asking what's, here yeah, there is, I observed uh, a certain separation, okay? What, what is the cause, what can change the separation between these two galaxies? So there is a fundamental quantity, because that's just all about gravity. And this fundamental quantity is the gravitational potential. 
And now I'm asking the following question. Could a constant gravitational potential do anything to the separation between these two galaxies? And the answer is not. The answer is not because the equation of motions, they depend only on gradient of the potential. So I ask the next question. Now I take a constant gradient, okay? There is a uniform constant gradient, potential gradient throughout right here, this volume. Could this affect the separation between the two galaxies? The answer is not, because I will just translate them, okay, in time, but I won't change the separation. So it's pretty clear that basically the number density, if you want, of these pairs has to be a function of second derivative of the potential. And what I mean by this, this is the only hopefully technical expression of the talk. What I mean is that it's some functional of the second derivative of the potential. And what I mean by t prime x prime is that you basically have to integrate this quantity along, if you want, the geodesic, okay? Taken by these two galaxies. So it's important to understand that actually the gradient of the potential did not disappear. Of course, they matter because you see, I mean, the galaxy has moved from one point to another point. You move because you have gradients. Okay, but what I mean is that you can reformulate the problem, the problem, and that was some of the things we've been doing, in such a way that if you want these gradients, they are even in the expression of this, of this quantity here. You do your Newtonian dynamics? Or yeah, the just Newtonian dynamics. Yeah. Oh, no, so it's not simple Newtonian dynamics. Yeah, simple Newtonian dynamics in an expanding universe. Yeah, absolutely. The bottom line is that then you can do the following. What you can do is, so here you have to integrate over the, you want the, the trajectory of one of these galaxies, okay? But what you can do is that you can basically expand the result, for instance, at a certain time, at final time. Okay, so then you will write, you will expand this, and that will become a series uh, of uh, basically quantities that depend on the second derivative of the potential or higher derivative, okay? all evaluated at the time at which you basically observe them, okay? And so from the Poisson equation, Poisson, sorry, equation, which tells me that the second derivative of the potential is the density perturbation, it's clear that the leading order term will be the density. But generally, this will be multiplied by some factor, B of delta, okay, I call it. And what does this factor depend on? It actually depends on the type of galaxies you're looking at. What it fundamentally means, it means the following. It means that when you look at fluctuations in the density of galaxies, you're not directly seeing fluctuations in the underlying matter density. I mean, there is a deformation because this factor is generically different from unity. And you can understand this in a very easy way. It's because, basically, galaxies that will form in dark matter halos. These dark matter halos are not randomly distributed in the universe. You will find most of them in the dense region and few of them in under dense region. Okay, so that's basically, if you want to create a bias, you will find more galaxies in over dense regions rather than in under dense regions. So that's basically the interpretation of this term. Generally, it will depend on the observed luminosity of the galaxy, the observed color, etc., etc. But it also includes interesting cosmological information. And so then you can go on, and, and basically you can, you can just, you do like a gradient expansion what you're doing. And so one, one, there are all kinds of questions which, which arise here. First of all, what are the effects of this gradient term? And so they can have actually significant effect whenever there are features. And you have actually features in the underlying distribution. I don't have time to go through this. But I want to point something else. If I write down here like a Taylor expansion, naively I will get also some square of quantities. The problem with square is that you basically have, it's always there, like everywhere, right? Basically means that you need to know what are the fluctuations doing at all scales. And so these quantities can diverge. It's exactly like in like quantum field theory, right? You have the same problem when they call like these composite operators, okay? And so you have the exact same problems when you do this type of calculations here. And so what you can do is the following. You can basically uh, assume that you will truncate the, if you want, you will truncate the, the contribution of fluctuations below a certain scale r. And then what you can do is that you write down this expansion in terms of this scale r, so you basically 
you have truncated your calculation, and then you make sure that as you vary a bit this scale r, <coughs> you still get the same result. So it's a very similar, I'm not sure if I explained this well, but it's basically very similar to like renormalization techniques, okay, also in quantum field theory. So in fact, over the past 10 years, what is my point is that there has, there are, there has been actually a lot of interaction with people from high energy regarding to how to deal with this, with this problem. Uh, let me just say now a few, a few two more things. Because once you have all this, it's not the end. Okay? Because what you are actually observing, you are observing photons coming from those galaxies. So you have effects that you need to worry about. And so there are basically essentially two types of effects. There are projection effect. Okay, because basically the propagation of the photons from the emitting galaxy to the telescope here on Earth will be actually affected by fluctuations in the gravitational potential. That's general relativity. There will be also a Doppler shift because of the relative velocity of the galaxy and us. And then there is another type of effect which has to do with the fact that the galaxies that you observe, they might actually be oriented, for instance, with like this quantity. And because you observe galaxies along a certain direction, this might basically introduce like, some spurious dependencies in your calculation. So you have to take all these effects into account. I mean, the bottom line is that it's not like a theory in the sky with diamonds. Right? It's really very connected to the data you want to measure. And so I just want to stress that, uh, so two very recent works. So in one of these works, we have been, what we try to do is, is to do the following. If you do this expansion, you get many terms with many potentially free coefficients. The question was, are there some modeling dependent relation between these coefficients? That's one of the things we tried to address. And now in this paper in preparation, which we are nearly done, we basically try to do like a next to leading order calculation of all this, including all the effects. Okay, and we think we are done. Okay, so let me conclude with an outlook. So future large scale surveys like Euclid satellite or large scale synoptic survey on the ground will actually get positions of billions of galaxies, a few billion galaxies, how to achieve two. So there will be a lot of data, what they call this big data, okay. There are, I mean, two issues here. The first issue is that it's nice, we have a lot of data, we have more and more powerful simulation. I think one big point to make is that the theory, I think, is still lying behind because there is not much focus on the theory side, and I think it's very important to focus on that. And then the second point that I want to make is that it's completely unclear what we're going to see, okay, what we're going to detect or not detect. Okay, we, maybe we will end up in 12 years and say, well, that's a cosmological constant with some dark matter that looks like a wind, but we just don't know what it is. At least there is one guaranteed detection which is the absolute mass case of neutrinos. Because that we know from solar oscillations that at least two of these neutrinos have to be massive. And the cool thing is that cosmology, cosmology can weight the mass of these neutrinos. And we know that a measurement of the mass scale of neutrinos is really within the range of these future surveys. So what we can do is really take the data, measure the neutrino mass, and see whether we, we get something that is meaningful. We get something that completely disagrees with the bound that we have, then uh, this means that basically their systematics is just not present. OK, so I will, I will stop here. Thank you for your time.
Yeah. Right. You could use you could use them as super long standard candle. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so you said, <coughs> or oh, you mentioned that the dark matter solved the problem of the small fluctuation that you observe, 10 to the minus 5 versus 10 to the minus 3, you otherwise would need to observe the current uh, uh, galaxies that we see. But so if you take the more version of gravity, can it also solve uh, without dark matter? So I don't have a precise answer to this. I know that some people implemented the version of, uh, of Bekenstein, Teves, in a uh, like cosmological context. I don't know what were the conclusions. Whether they, I think they claim they could manage to reproduce the, the, the uh, anisotropies in the cosmic microwave uh, temperature reasonably well. So to some extent, uh, well. But I don't know more than that. But, but these theories are now in serious uh, trouble with uh, because they predict like a speed of, uh, propagation speed for a gravitational wave. I think that is different from that of light oh. because there is this extra scalar field that you have to prove. Mm. Yeah. So I actually have two questions. The one related to that. Um, so I thought that one cannot do cannot solve the large scale uh, structure. Cannot generate that. So it was the little puzzle. Of the Talk about one that seems to be. I mean, it's something that, that is not going to solve large scale structure. So it's related to the question of R E one because so so there is there is like a, there is a version like a more sophisticated more sophisticated version of Mon which is Tevez and which I think seem to be doing reasonably well. But there are some there are some constraints. For instance, uh, there are some actually some measurement. Um, which are very difficult to explain. And one of them is, for instance, this bullet cluster. I guess you've heard about that. So you basically have, we basically have an observation of two clusters colliding between, uh, between each other. And then we basically see the two clusters after, they have, after the first passage. Okay? So then you see galaxies here and galaxies there. And then in the, in the middle, you see like some plat plum of, of very odd gas, which is the gas that was shocked by the collision. Okay? And basically, just because it's collisional, it's dead in the middle, right? While well, dark matter is it's collisional, so it just went through. The thing is that then when you do lensing observation, okay, around the two clusters of galaxies, you see that there is a huge mass there, right? Which is not something that one would give you, okay? Want to give you that the mass is where the gas, where the hot gas is, okay? And so it's very difficult to explain this type, I think, of observations with like uh, a modification of gravity such as this one. And the other question was, um, so, so you have some effective theories for the, uh, for the densities in terms of uh, with some scale R that emerges. That's the, and so when you compare this thing to the data, is there, a specific value that emerges for the scale R, something like up to this scale, uh, you seem to describe the physics? So I want to say something about that because I didn't say all. Uh, so that's actually one way to deal with the problem. You put this scale R and you assume that, you know, you have to. You want to it basically, you assume you don't know what's the small scale physics, so you have to integrate over it in one way. Okay? It's exactly this. But in fact, when you go to simulations, what you see is that there is a true physical scale R because halos will accrete matter from the surrounding only across, across a certain scale. And this scale is very well defined. So in fact, there is another approach, which actually uh, I'm actually pushing forward, which is to actually not, not do an effective filter, but really try to extract this physical scale from simulation, okay, understand it, and then to do the calculation that way. And the scale is just the scale of the halo? So that would basically be essentially the scale of the halo, exactly. Which, which is there, it's, it's, it's physical. <coughs> How many free parameters does the analysis rely on? That would use the function f of the kind of forces of the second number of the halo? So, so here, 
Yeah, so here when you do this at like, uh, what I say, like next to leading order, okay, whatever that means, you already get to like uh, 20 in this one. So obviously, with 20 you could fit like nearly everything unless you understand what they're doing. So, so I think it's very important to go into this question of, you know, really understanding the physics of this collapse and only now structural formation. We don't have much choice. Okay, let's thank uh, this for the